welcome to the international broadcast ministry of No Limits. I am Pastor Delman Coates and here at No Limits, we wanna help strengthen you, encourage you and empower you to feel God's love and to live your life without limitation. Today's message is about to begin and I wanna thank you for watching and know that I'm praying for you to hear a special word from God as you watch. Today I want to return to the topic of unresolved trauma and how if we are not careful, unresolved trauma can wreak havoc on our lives. Amen? Amen. I see it all the time as a pastor, people struggling to have thriving and successful relationships because of some past experience in their lives or some psychological injury from their childhood that affects how they communicate, how they handle conflict how they manage their emotions, and how they even handle stress. Mm -hmm. It manifests with people having trust issues, abandonment issues, financial problems, addictions, and the inability to function in a healthy way. When people have been wounded emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually, it prevents them from being able to have healthy relationships. They struggle with depression. And some find themselves trapped in a cycle of dysfunction, going from one dysfunctional relationship to another. Amen. Or they may, they may be able to dress themselves up on the outside. Mm -hmm. They may be able to hide it behind fake smiles and religious jargon. <laughs> they may be able to mask it underneath designer clothes and a big personality, but on the inside, they're hurting struggling with pain buried in the deep recesses of their mind. And the trauma gets triggered whenever they encounter an experience or a conversation that reminds them of the pain in their past. Okay. You ever found yourself talking to someone and their reaction just didn't match what you all were talking about? I mean, some way, the volume of their response or the passion of their response just didn't match what you were talking about. Well, oftentimes, that's because they're responding not to you, but they're responding to something that got triggered in their subconscious mind. And they were no longer having a conversation with you. They were actually having a dialogue with the people who hurt them in their past. Perhaps it was a parent who mistreated or abandoned them. Perhaps it was an uncle or a family friend who touched them inappropriately. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it was a former partner who betrayed them, lied to them, cheated on them. And the reason they don't trust you isn't because of anything you have done, but because they cannot get past the last person who did them wrong. Yeah. The sad part is that oftentimes... Many people don't even recognize and realize how their actions and behaviors in the present are linked to unresolved feelings, emotions, and issues that were sown in their psyche in the past. Amen. It could have been as a result of some form of physical, sexual, or emotional abuse or the sadness they felt when their parents divorced or the grief that they were not able to uh, express when their loved one died. It could be as a result or as a consequence of growing up poor or rich or being teased and bullied or being raised by perfectionist parents or growing up in a home where people cared more about your appearance and your accomplishments than they did about how you were doing or being raised in a household where, where you were never shown the kind of love and tenderness and affection that you felt you deserved. And whether we realize it or not, there are a whole lot of traumatized people around us. There are a lot of traumatized, Bible-carrying, tongue-talking, church-going, cross-wearing Christians all around us. People who deal with pain and hurt and emotions from the residue of their past. That actually was the case for the Jewish patriarch, Jacob. For a long time, I thought that Jacob was a bad guy. It's what I was taught in Sunday school. It's, 
It's what I always heard preached in the pulpit. It's what all of the Christian commentaries and biblical commentaries said about Jacob. They said that he was a trickster, a liar, a cheater, and they said that about him because that's the name that his parents gave him. Jacob means trickster. It means deceiver. Jacob in Hebrew means one who supplants. And they said that his evil character was confirmed when he conned his brother Esau out of his birthright and with his mother tricked his father Isaac into doing the very same thing. Mm -hmm. Must have been a bad guy, so they say. And if, and if you read his story from Genesis 25 to Genesis 32, and, and if you listen to what the religious tradition said about Jacob, you would probably reach the same conclusion. You would probably conclude that he sounds like a pretty despicable guy. But the other day, I began to wonder whether this view of Jacob's character was flawed. As I interrogated and as I wondered where this perspective of Jacob's character originated. Mm -hmm. Those of you who are Bible readers know that this view of Jacob, that he is a deceiver and a trickster, started not so much with Jacob or with anything he had done, but with how the adults and those around him interpreted something he did when he was born. Yes. According to Genesis 25, verse 26, the text says that when Jacob was born, that he grabbed his brother Esau's heel. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they named him Jacob, which means deceiver. That's it. That's all he did. Within minutes of him coming into the world, people in the family concluded and interpreted the actions of a child in the most seditious way possible. Wow. And they are the ones who put that label and named him trickster or someone who supplants. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, <clears throat> of all of the ways to interpret that act, why assume uh, such a negative motivation and put that on a baby? I mean, these two babies had been in their mother's womb for nine months, sharing the same amniotic fluid, relying on the same food supply, sharing a, a, a bond and closeness that only a set of twins could experience. Why not interpret that act as a gesture of love? and longing from one brother to another, wanting to maintain the bond and closeness they shared for nine months. Why? Mm -hmm. Why not view that action as a positive rather than a negative? Yeah. Why put that interpretation on a newborn baby? And then I did some research. And I learned that the Jewish tradition of the time had a custom called the birthright. And according to that tradition, the firstborn male child of the family was to receive a double portion of the family inheritance. Right. So is it possible, I began to wonder, whether Jacob, whether Jacob grabbing Esau's heel was less about the secondborn trying to be a trickster and whether it was more about the parents and the family and the religious community looking for a rationale to justify their religious ideology. I mean, how does a child who is just being born into the world even know what, what, what a birthright is anyway? <laughs> How much sense does that make? And, and here we are believing the narrative that his parents put on him, <laughs> believing the story that the community and the temple and the history of biblical scholarship put on Jacob for something that he could not even have known about when he was born a label that was used to justify a system of social and religious discrimination just because of how a person was born. Y'all hold on here. This child who came to be called Jacob 
could not control how he was born. <laughs> he could not help that he was born that way. He could not help that he was born second. So why develop a set of cultural norms and practices to deny him equal treatment in the family and equal treatment in the society simply because of how the boy was born? <laughs> doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't make sense to me, but that's what the boy who came to be called deceiver had to deal with. He had to deal with a father who favored Esau over him, not because of anything that Jacob had done, but just because of how he was born. Yeah. Yeah. He had to deal with parents who told people this narrative about him being a trickster. He had to deal with teachers at school and kids in the neighborhood and priests at the temple who teased him and looked at him a certain way because they said that he couldn't be trusted. They said that he was a liar. And they said that he was trying to supplant his brother by grabbing on to him. What kind of sense does that make? To put that kind of narrative and assumption on a child. And that's when it dawned on me, church, that the boy who was named Jacob was not a trickster. He was not a deceiver, as they assumed. He was not trying to steal a birthright from his brother. <laughs> he was instead a victim of religious and parental abuse. Mm -hmm. He was psychologically and mentally abused, and he suffered from the time that he was born in a household that mistreated him and judged him and labeled him and projected their biases and insecurities upon him simply because of the way that that boy was born. And day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year, he had to grow up in a home with parents who, rather than seeing him as a success, saw him as a menace who rather than treating him like an equal, treated him like a pariah, who rather than showing him love and affection, showed him suspicion and contempt. And that is the worst kind of environment for a child to be raised in. Amen. That's the worst kind of home to have to grow up in. Talk about trauma. And he carried that psychological injury with him all of his life. And the reason he may have manipulated to get ahead as a teenager and a young adult is not because he was a deceiver but because all of his life he internalized the messages and the mental abuse that those around him projected upon him. And because they said he was a deceiver from birth, he began to believe what other people said about him. Are y'all listening? Amen. Amen. And by the time we catch up with Jacob in the 32nd chapter of Genesis, it has been 14 years since he tried to patch things up with his brother Esau. Jacob is feeling guilty now. Their relationship has become toxic, and even though Jacob tries to move on by getting married and having a family and working for his uncle Laban, he cannot move forward because the pain of his past is so heavy. It is haunting him that is weighing him down. Are y'all listening to me? I'm preaching this because someone listening to me right now is just like Jacob. You're stuck in life, unable to move forward, forward because you have some unresolved injury in your past that is hindering your progress and is holding you down. You know, you know when, you, when, a, when, when a cut is not properly treated, it can get infected. 
And to make matters worse, it can spread to other parts of the body. And before you know it, you don't just have an issue in the area where you got the cut. You now start having issues in other areas. And it all happened because uh, uh, the injury did not get taken care of. And someone listening to me right now has an untreated cut in your spirit. Someone listening to me right now has an untreated cut in your past. Someone listening to me right now right now has an untreated wound in the psyche of your mind. I don't know what it is, but you know what it is. And because you've been walking around trying to self-medicate, walking around trying to act as if nothing is bothering you, the cut is getting worse and it's metastasizing and spreading all over your body. Someone listening and, and the cut is preventing you from having good relationships with others. That cut is causing you to struggle with your relationship with God. And some of you can't even deal with yourself. Uh, you have to constantly listen to music because uh, you don't want to hear the thoughts in your mind. Uh, but there's some good news. Uh, can I tell you something? The good news of the text is that after trying to suppress his trauma for 14 years, that after trying to run away from his trauma, one day, somebody say one day. One day Jacob realizes at the Jabbok River that he cannot run from his past trauma any longer. It's, it, it's affecting his mind. It's, been, it's affecting his heart. His heart is heavy. It's affecting his body. It's starting to get sick. And it is causing him stress. It is destroying his relationships and is preventing him from walking into his future. Yeah. One day. Somebody say one day. Oh, what a difference a day makes. <laughs> On this one day, it's as if Jacob knows that something greater is up ahead. <laughs> and he cannot possess it until he deals and heals with the pain that is buried in his past. And in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28, God, through the angel, Gabriel, uh, through the angel gives him a new name. <laughs> Y'all not here. <laughs> It's as if he is finally free from the trauma that he, that's been holding him down. The angel says, from now on, you shall no longer be called Jacob. Let me stop right there. You shall no longer be defined by the label your daddy put on you. You shall no longer be limited by the trauma that was inflicted upon your mind. You shall no longer see yourself and reduce yourself to the hurtful tag that others branded you with. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but now, child of God, you're going to be called Israel. I feel my help coming. You have striven with God and with humans, and you have now prevailed. Don't miss your shout. You do know what Israel means, don't you? Israel in Hebrew means one who has prevailed. Israel means one who is victorious. Israel means somebody who's a winner, who is an overcomer. And for Jacob, that is a new perspective on his life and his new sense of self-worth and perspective on his future changed from the negative word that they spoke over him when he was born to the new word that God was trying to speak over his life right now. Y'all not here. God was trying to reveal something to Jacob and indirectly to us that he was never a liar in the first place. God was trying to tell him that he was never a trickster. He was never a deceiver. That was the result of the trauma that his parents put on him and the bad theology that they were teaching down there at that temple. Y'all not there. All of that stuff that was in his mind because of how he was born, it got attached to him. But it was not who he was. Jacob was not someone who was conniving and cunning and cutthroat. He was a victim of mental and religious abuse. He was a victim of Bible abuse from a culture that projected their biases onto the way that he was born. 
And they just used the idea that he was trying to steal something that he could not have even known about as an infant to justify their bad religion. To justify their unfair treatment of him. And that's traumatic for a child. And, J and Jacob spent his life having to grow up in a family, trying to navigate his way through school, trying to go through dates, trying to have relationships, uh, trying to go throughout life being branded by parents in a community that, that, that did not think he was going to be anything. And church, I discovered that there are a lot of people who were traumatized as children, who did not receive love and affection and affirmation from the people around them. And they were raised by negative and narcissistic parents who abused them and abandoned them and failed them in so many ways. And that's trauma. And when your very being and identity become the basis for other people to put their labels on you, to have people say you are not deserving of equal treatment because of how you were born that's traumatic it's traumatic trying to grow up and live in a world that deprives you like Jacob of equal treatment of equal education of quality health care of decent jobs based upon the realities of your birth whether it's your zip code your race your gender or your sexual orientation society does it all the time dictates and decides that some people are going to have a head start that some people are going to have a leg up that some people are going to get to the front of the line because of who their parents parents were, how much money they have, and the color of their skin, while other people have to struggle and figure out how to make it on their own. Y'all got here, Jacob was not a deceiver. He was the victim of a culture that traumatized him and mistreated him all of his life based upon who he was and how he was born. But the night that Jacob wrestled with that angel, he discovered something, y'all. He learned something. Did I tell y'all my sermon title? My sermon title is I've Learned My Lesson. Tell your neighbor, I've learned my lesson. That night, Jacob learns that while he cannot change what people did to him in his past, while he could not change what they said about him or how they labeled him, he could change how he saw himself. You shall no longer be called Jacob. You shall no longer be limited by their label. You shall no longer be confined by how they define you. You shall be called Israel. And God sent me on assignment today to tell somebody that you shall no longer be confined to the labels of people around you. You are not a victim. You are a victor. Have I got a witness? And that change in perspective gave Jacob a new lease on life. It changed. It's a change in perspective for somebody who has been trapped by the trauma of your past. It's a change of perspective for somebody to live the impossible. That's the lesson that God wanted Jacob and that God wants us to understand about the scars of life. That what was intended to defeat you can actually be used to develop you. Y'all not here. The, the lesson is that what the devil designed to destroy you, woo, that if you are still alive, woo, it's going to make you better, honey. <laughs> Come on, type in the comments. I learned my lesson. I want you to think about Joseph. Joseph had brothers who sold him into slavery. And I believe in Genesis chapter 50, uh, Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God is going to use it. 
for my good. You tried to stab me in the back. You tried to scandalize my name. You called me everything but a child of God. And God's going to take every dart and every weapon that you formed against me. And he's going to use it for my good. Have I got a witness? Paul said all things are working for the good of them that love God and are called according to his promise. For the last 14 years, Jacob has been down and depressed because of the pain of his past. But he learned a lesson on that day at the Jabbok River. He learned that the weapon that was formed against him did not prosper. He learned the lesson that what the enemy intended to defeat him was actually developing him. And that's the lesson that God wants you and that God wants me to learn. That what the devil intended to stop me is really going to transform me. That what the enemy thought was going to be my end is just my beginning. Honey. Somebody ought to bless God right there because you should have been dead and gone right now but you are still here and somebody ought to bless God that after all of the hell that you've been through you are still here come on type in the comments a third time I've learned my lesson Jacob got a new name and Jacob got a new perspective um, but the sign that your perspective changes is when your behavior changes. <laughs> Y'all, we, we're talking about trauma. See, the, the way that you know that you have a new uh, perspective about your trauma is when you develop a new pattern of behavior after your trauma. Y'all here, <laughs> never again do we see Jacob manipulating other people. Never again do we see Jacob allowing other people to manipulate him. Somebody say, never again. Never again do we see Jacob repeating the same cycle of abuse and trauma and dysfunction that visited his life as a child. Once the Lord gives him a new name, once the Lord gives him a new perspective, he starts looking different and he starts acting different. Have I got a, a, a witness here? Somebody ought to say never again. Come on, type in the comment section. Never again. I'm not going to walk the way I used to walk. I'm not going to talk the way I used to talk. Jacob got victory, not over God, but over his past. He realized that while his past was painful, that his future was greater than his past. Have I got a witness? And when God gave him a new name, he realized that the things that he used to do, he didn't do anymore. The places he used to go, he didn't go any longer. Somebody shout never again. The things I used to do, I don't do as often. Yeah, that's a change. And the places I used to go, I don't go as often. All of his life, he felt limited by the labels of other people. But now he discovered that regardless of what other people said about him, and regardless of how they defined him, that he that was in him was greater than he that was in the world. Haven't got a witness here. He saw himself differently. So he behaved differently. And that ought to result, that ought to be a result of the trauma that we go through. When you go through trauma, you ought not repeat some of the same stuff that you went through before. Listen, church, you can't repair what you repeat. Y'all not here. If you were abused in your last relationship, you ought to be discerning enough not to get into another abusive one. Y'all not here. That doesn't mean that the abuse was your fault. It was not your fault. That does not mean that you deserve it. You did not deserve it. But what it does mean is that once you experience crazy, 
You ought to be hypersensitive to crazy the next time crazy calls you at 2 in the morning. Y'all not here. Somebody type in the comments, I see crazy. I recognize crazy when I see it. I, I remember when I lived in Boston many years ago, I was going one day to the site. I worked in Roxbury. Uh, I worked for the Urban League, and one day on my way to church, on my way to my job, rather, I turned down this back street to take what I thought was a shortcut. And when I turned down this street, I ended up messing up my car because I hit this huge pothole. And when I hit this huge pothole, it broke the car's axle. It damaged the rim of the car, and it cost me $3,500 to fix. And that was on a graduate student's budget. So you know something? The next week, when I had to go to work, I didn't go down that same street. Y'all not here. The next time I had to go that way, I didn't take the shortcut because I remembered the pain and the price that I had to pay the first time. Y'all not here. And because I learned the first time, I knew not to do the same thing. Some of us uh, come out of trauma, but we keep going back into trauma. Y'all not listening. We keep repeating the same cycles with the same kind of people, with the same kind of argumentative spirit, with the same conflict resolution issues, with the same abandonment problems. And I want to tell you that you got to learn from your trauma by not repeating the same mistakes from your past. I, I'm, a, I, 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 I got, I'm not going to go back to the same problems, the same people, and the same habits that caused me so much harm. But you know why people do that? You know why people go back to the same problems? It's because they don't change their narrative. Yeah. See, if you want to make sure you don't receive, repeat the same patterns, you got to change your narrative about your life. I learned something about trauma recently that I found very powerful. Contrary to what many people as assume, I learned that trauma is not created by the external experiences we encounter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we go through a lot of painful things. I learned that trauma is not caused and created by the external experiences we encounter, as bad as they are. I learned that trauma is created by the internal messages we tell ourselves about the external experience. Are y'all here? Y'all listening? <laughs> the external experience is just the catalyst, but it's not the cause. Uh, therefore, Jacob's trauma was not caused by the abuse and the labels uh, that were placed upon him as bad as they were. Those things were just the external catalyst. The trauma was caused by the messages he told himself as a child in light of what other people were saying about him. Y'all not here. So even though the religious community and his family unfairly called him trickster and opposed upon him a set of expectations that no child should have to endure, the trauma was not in what they did. The trauma is not in what they said. The trauma is in the story he told himself. Y'all not here. His deceptive behavior occurred not so much because of their abuse, because people are unfortunately mentally abused all the time. His behavior occurred because of what he said to himself when they 
put that on him. He became a liar and a cheater and a deceiver because he believed and he internalized what they said. So what this means is that what causes the trauma is not so much in what somebody did as wrong as it was. And it was wrong. But what made it traumatic to you were in the messages you told yourself about what they did. Have I got a witness? The trauma was not so much that your parents got divorced. People get divorced all the time. The trauma occurred in the narrative that the child tells him or herself about the divorce. Stories like, perhaps I'm to blame because mama and daddy didn't work out. Stories like, you can't trust those who love you because they'll eventually leave you. Now that's why you got abandonment issues. Stories like the people you love will always eventually walk away. So you struggle now as an adult, not because your parents didn't work out, but in the messages you told yourself when they didn't work out. The trauma you experienced down at here wasn't so much in what other people did and what they did was wrong and it should not have happened but the trauma occurred when you wondered if you deserved it when you told yourself that perhaps the person could not help putting their hands on you when you told yourself that that's how people show love when grown men touch children it's the message that you tell yourself and you keep going and repeating the cycle of your life because the narrative that you tell yourself keeps playing over and over in your mind. And the lesson you got to learn is that you can tell yourself a different story. Have I got a witness? I may not be able to change what they did, but I can change the narrative I tell myself about what they did to me. Have I got a witness? And after Jacob wrestled with that angel all night, he's given a new way of defining himself. Jacob can't change his family. He can't change his past. He cannot change the names that other people called him. But God says, you can change what you call yourself. Have I got a witness? I don't know about you, but growing up, there were kids who used to bully uh, all the time and one day one of them called me out of my name and I ran home upset and I was crying and I'll never forget what my parents said to me. <laughs> they said, Delman, it doesn't matter what other people call you. What matters is what you will answer to. Have I got a witness? And too many of us have answered to the wrong name. The name of low expectation. The name of insecurity. The name of low self-esteem, the name of fear of betrayal, the name of anger management, the name of low expectation. But God sent me here to tell somebody that you got to give yourself a brand new name. Have I got a witness? You can't change the past, but you can re-edit Revise, rephrase, rename, reorient the message you tell yourself. God says you're no longer Jacob. That's the name in your past. That's the name of your yesterday. That's the message that's dead. You got a new name have I got a witness type in the comments you got a new name and your new name is blessed healed delivered victorious favored thrive
prosperous. Come on, tell your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I got a new name. And it's sober in glory. And it's mine. All mine. Have I got a witness? Come on, is there anybody who can thank God that you got a new name? Your new name is promise. Your new name is destiny. Your new name is conqueror. Your new name is victor. So you don't have to wait till the battle is over. You can start shouting, dancing, and leaping. Have I got a witness? Come on, slap high five with somebody in your house and say, neighbor, you got to tell yourself a new story. You're not broke. You're not defeated. You're not sick. You're not a victim. You're not a liar. God has given you a new name. Have I got a witness? And everything that you went through, there was a lesson God wanted you to get. And there was some glory God wanted you to give. And if you're still here, if it didn't destroy you, you want to give him the best praise that you have. Have I got a witness? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson. I thank God for bringing me through. And you don't know, like I know, what the Lord has done for me. Yeah! Yeah! Have I got a witness? Come on, look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, it didn't happen to you. It happened for you. And you're coming out better, stronger, wiser, brighter, healthier on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. When you go through what you've gone through, there's a lesson God wanted you to get. And there is some glory God wants you to give. I want to tell someone you have been through too much for you not to worship the Lord. Come on, somebody right at home right now. I want you to type in the comments, I've been through too much for me not to worship the Lord. I've been through too much chaos, so much confusion for me not to worship God. Thank you, Lord. There was a lesson that God wanted you to get. And there is some glory that God wants you to give. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name. Come on, church. Help me to worship him right where you are. I've been through too much. I've been through too many trials. I've been through too many storms. I've been through too many valleys for me not to worship the Lord. Come on, church. Right where you are. Just lift up your hands and begin to worship him as we worship him. Come on, we're going to create a cyber sanctuary. Glory, come on. Come on. I've been through too much, child of God. You 
you have gone through too much pain. You have been doing too much trouble. And if it didn't destroy you, it's going to develop you. It's going to make you stronger. It's going to make you wiser. This sermon was for some Jacob listening to me right now. Someone who has suffered with trauma that has been visited upon your life and you have endured your entire life with the pain, the hurt, and the labels that other people have placed upon you. God told me to tell you, you shall no longer be defined by other people's labels. You shall no longer be confined to the trauma of your past. You shall now be called Israel. You shall now be called Victor. One who prevails. That's who you are. And in order for you to change your perspective and for, in order for you to change your pattern of behavior, you're going to have to change your narrative, child of God. You're going to have to tell yourself a different narrative about the trauma of your past. The childhood you said, oh, but maybe I deserved it. Maybe this is how people show love. You gotta tell yourself a new, par a new narrative. And if you tell yourself a new narrative, you'll be able to walk into your future. Amen. I've learned my lesson. I, I don't know about you, but I learned my lesson. Uh -huh, I learned my lesson. In the 17 years I've been pastoring, there is one area that I have found in which people consistently struggle. That is in establishing a daily routine to spend time in the presence of God, something I believe is so critical to growing in Christ. To help you begin each day with the Lord, I have developed the No Limits Daily Devotional email that is available to you for free. This devotional contains a Bible reading, some commentary, and a closing prayer. It is a great way to start your day in communion with God. Request to begin receiving your free devotional emails right now at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. Thank you in advance for signing up, and I pray it helps you live each day with no limits. I want to invite you to join me on an incredible journey through the ancestral trail of African heritage as we visit Ghana in the fall of 2022. Located in the heart of West Africa, Ghana is known for its lush forests, diverse animal life, and miles of sandy beaches along with its rich history. Join me as we pay homage to key figures in black history, enjoy a traditional African naming ceremony, and visit a wonderful museum dedicated to the Ashanti Kingdom. You can learn more about this trip on my website at delmancoats.org, but don't delay in signing up as space is very limited. 
Thank you for watching today's message, and I look forward to traveling with you to Ghana next fall. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org and look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of No Limits and Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland.